welcome to section 11. This is our last section for this course. But never mind, we still have a few lectures to get through. I am excited because we're going to be wrapping up this course by looking at network programming. We'll see how easy Go makes it to be able to write like a HTTP client, a HTTP server, and just a general TCP IP client and server using the standard net package. We're going to be looking at using the net slash HTTP package. The net package is the top level package and there are sub packages within it. And one of them is HTTP. And this is more specific. It's part of networking, but it's more specific to a certain type of networking. It has to do with like web browser and web servers, mostly what you do on the internet. We're going to look at writing a simple HTTP client. We'll see just how simple that is. We'll, of course, in writing an HTTP client, we'll look at sending requests. And I'll talk about that in a minute. If sending requests or a client doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. We'll talk about it in a minute. I'm just laying out the things that we're going to do. We're going to look at writing an HTTP server too. And we'll have to deal with handling requests because if a client sends us a request, we want to be able to handle that request. And then we'll look at the net package itself and how we can use that to write like a TCP IP client, which is more and more generic type of um, networking client and a TCP IP server. Now that's the overall view of what we're going to be covering in this section. But of course, everything has to start with lecture one. Now keep in mind, just like the previous section, when we talk about the FUMT package, the OS package and the IO packages, we only delve into a little bit of it to give ourselves an introduction because one, this is an introductory course, and two, those things are really, really in depth and large. The same thing is going to happen with network programming or even the net slash HTTP package or the net package. We're not going to cover everything. This is just to get you up and running. So please read the documentation, practice, look at other resources. So let's talk about a simple HTTP server and client. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at creating an HTTP client, and we're going to do that by issuing a GET request. Very simple. If this doesn't make sense, what is a GET request? Don't worry, we'll see. When it comes to HTTP protocol, there are a number of request types of requests you can send. It's called the request method. Don't worry, we'll see more about that later, when, especially when we look at the code. And then we'll see how to create an HTTP server. And when it comes time to write our HTTP server, of course, we have to deal with handling requests. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then in the next section, we're going to even spend more time talking about handling requests and how to build better HTTP servers. If you are new to network communication, this idea of server and client might be a little bit strange or something that you've heard about, but you don't quite understand. So let's go with that assumption and try to see if we can break it down. So when I say a server, I'm talking about a piece of software that's playing a certain role. Now, some of you say server, they mean hardware, and that is true too. Well, in that case, is the software that runs on this hardware. But, and then you could have multiple pieces of software running on that hardware. But here I'm extracting it and saying that a server is simply a piece of software that runs and act in a certain manner. How does it behave? Well, a server provides services. So basically, a server can do things on behalf of clients. So the client is any actor who wants a service from or wants something from the server. And so the client will make a request to the server for one of its services. More specifically, when we talk about computer server and client, what we're saying is that there's a computer somewhere with some software software on it. And again, it could be one piece of software or multiple. And then the clients could be anything, other computers or your cell phone, anything. It could be a fridge, you know, a toaster. And today with home appliances and the smart home, it's lights and thermostats and all that stuff. All those things act as clients to some server somewhere. Also, there's this very confusing thing. Something that's a client to one server can also be a server to something else, to another client. By that, what I mean is that while your thermostat might be a client to a server out on the internet where it reaches out and get weather data and the current temperature, your phone might be a client that connects to that thermostat. And the thermostat in that case is providing the service of um, responding to your phone's command and so on. So um, that's a little bit weird, but we're not going to be doing 
any of that. And again, it's not that strange. It's just basically combining the role of client and server in one application, maybe, or on one box. Let's talk a little bit about HTTP communication. This is the first thing we're going to be dealing with. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transport Protocol. So what is a protocol? Protocol is just the rules for communication. Anytime you and somebody have to talk, you have to agree on what you need to say, how you're going to say it, when you pause, and that is the protocol you use. And so that's just a rule for communication. And so the two parties that are communicating are going to be your client, which is usually a web browser, but it doesn't have to be. It can be any HTTP client because today with so many smart clients out there, a number of different things are connecting to web and requesting data. And data can be served to clients using HTTP protocol that previously you wouldn't have not think about as being HTTP client or as HTTP as the way to exchange data. And so the web server or your server is going to be a web server. But again, it doesn't have to be a web server in terms of serving up pages to a web browser. It can just be any server that uses the HTTP protocol. Why HTTP? Why use this protocol? There are a number of other protocols, but the reason for using HTTP is that HTTP is fairly simple compared to many of the other protocols. HTTP is very easy to reason about because it's just made up of requests and responses. By that, what I mean is there's more to the protocol, but from the point of view of looking from the outside at the interaction between the client and the server, all you see is that the client make requests and the server respond to those requests. Right? And so for that reason, it's fairly simple. Something to note here is that the server never initiates a connect, uh, exchange. In certain situations, there are like exceptions, like once a client and server is connected, then software that's running on the server could push data to the client, but we're not talking about that. To start that whole communication, the client had to reach out to the server. Now, before we look at code, just keep in mind that you have things that you can read, and basically that's going to be the net slash HTTP package documentation. Let's jump into the code. Here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor, and we're going to start in section 11, lecture one, and we'll start with our client application. So if I click on this main.go, see this is the client application, and we'll close the explorer so we can get some space. And let's examine what we. So I have two string constants. I have one called localhost, which has HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost colon and a number. Now, what this really means is simply I have what is called protocol colon, and that's how you do it, the protocol. So that part is the protocol. And then the host name, and then optionally the port. So that's the port. And so the port in this example is port one, two, three, four, five. Now, what does the port do? Well, on any computer, remember we say you can have a server running and a server might offer one or more services. Well, what if you have multiple servers on the same computer? As a client, you need to know which one you're connecting to. So the servers are given individual ports and unique port number. And so this says, I want to connect to the server running on port one, two, three, four, five on this host. If I put a different number here, it would be another server running on the same computer. Okay, so we'll see how this is going to be used later, but I'm just explaining what it is. And this before the host name is called the protocol. So in this case, I'm saying I want to use the HTTP protocol. And we talked about HTTP already. It's the hypertext transport protocol. And this is just an indication to the networking layer how it should do that conversation. Remember we said protocol means how the rules for communication. So the networking layer needs to know how to, to communicate with that server. And so by saying that you use an HTTP, it knows how to do that. This example, we use an HTTPS. The S here means secure. So in this case, I'm saying I want you to do secure communication, right? Or talk securely to this server, and this server happens to be Google uh, on the web, and it's google.com. So this name, even though it has a dot in it, still refers to a host name. It's still resolved to a computer somewhere. And in this case, we don't have to put the port because HTTPS, the default port number is 443. So when we leave out the port, the port number, we're saying 
use the default port number for it for HTTPS. For HTTP, the default port number is actually 80, but because I do not have a serverless NAN to port 80 on my local host, well, I have to overwrite it. All right, so that is just some strings. Don't worry about it. The real interesting part is here. This is the line that's actually doing all the work. We import the HTTP package, and you can see package HTTP provides HTTP client and server implementations for get, head, post, and da 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 da. And those are get, head, and post are the HTTP methods that I mentioned in, during our slides. And we are going to use the get method. It's one of the easiest methods you can use for HTTP. And so we're saying HTTP perform a get request to this host. And notice the host in this case would be Google. So it says get issues a get. Notice the two different gets. So this get is the function name issues a get request, meaning a request, HTTP request using the get method, which is in all uppercase. We'll see a little bit in the next lecture, or we can sort of figure out which method um, the client made when we write a server. Remember what I said, in HTTP, the client makes a request, which in this case, and the server responded, and whatever the server sent back is in this response object. So if you don't have any errors, you can ignore this, and you can certainly ignore this part. And so what we have then is we're going to defer closing the body field, which is happens to be a struct member, on this response variable. Whatever we get from the response in terms of the body, which is the data from the server, we have to call close on it. And so body is a read closer. We talk about this when we talk about the pipe, or was it had a read close and a write closer so that you can read and close from it or write and close. And so that is what we're gonna do. And notice what we use. We use io.copy to copy stuff from this read closer, write it to standard out, and at the end of it, when it reads everything from the body, to do a close here. Now let's run our code and see what happens. And it went out to Google and it came back with some data. Now we can redirect this to a file and then use our web browser to open it. And you should certainly try that. But that's the text that represents Google's own page. Now, what happened if we fail to read from Google? And I'm going to simulate not being able to read from Google by just putting some junk in there. And so there's no host name or website with that name, hopefully. And so this is the same as if we didn't have network. And so once that fail, we'll get an error. And so our error we're going to say is if we have an error connecting to this host, we should say we can't connect to the host. And now we're going to try our local host. Notice our local host is just HTTP protocol, local host, which means our computer, and then something that's running on port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's on our computer. Don't worry about you don't have anything running on port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I just picked that number. Hopefully it's safe for you. If it's not, if you have something running that port, just change it. And you'll know in a minute if you do. And so then it tries to do the same thing. It tries to do the same get request on our local server that's running on our computer or wherever you're running this. And then if it fails that, then it application fails. Because at that point, we can't connect to Google, we can't connect to our second fallback, so we fail. But if we can, we also defer close on that, and we do the same thing, copy. So let's clear our screen, and now we try to rerun our program. And we should expect it to fail connecting to this, and it does. And then it tried to connect locally, it sees as trying, HTTP local holds at one entry. And that also failed. That's because we do not have a local server. So let's do this. Let's start a local server. So now I've opened a second terminal. And so if I go up a bit and then go into server. And so we'll simply run the server. We're not going to look at the code. Just trust it for now. And now it says that it's listening on port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we rerun our code unmodified. And notice how we're able to fetch some text. So again, it doesn't really matter what this text says, it's just HTML, and it was able to fetch it. That's the thing that's important. So this is how easy it is to write an HTTP client, reach out to a HTTP server and fetch data. So now let's take a look at our server. So if we close this and open our server, very simple, we have a string that says, I want you to listen on port one, two, three, four, five. Now, why do I put it like this? Well, here, this would be 
the host name that represent the interfaces you want to listen on and so you can do stuff like 127.0.0.1 or something like that but since i want to listen on all available interfaces on my computer i decided to just leave that out and so now for my main program what i'm doing is i print out a message saying that our server is listening on this port so we can at least see it when we run our server and we see that here server is listening on that and we just simply print out that value. Then we call the handle fun function. This is a function being exported by the package HTTP. If you read the documentation for this angle func function, it says angle func registers the handler function for the given pattern in the default server mux. Now, there's a lot here to chew on. Default server mux that does multiplexing. Multiplexing having to do with when I see different patterns here or paths in my request, how do I handle it? And this one just says when you see forward slash or the root request, then call this function. Now the function I have a very specific signature. The function which I wrote here is handler and has this parameter called W, which is HTTP response writer. This should be a hint as to what this is. Remember, we talked about writers before. This just happened to be a response writer. So we know this is going to be an interface and it's any value that implements whatever this response writer require and that's as defined for its interface. And hence why this is an interface value. And we can use this now to call some methods. Now, the second parameter is a pointer. And this now is an HTTP request. So we know this is going to be a struct value. And so we can then interrogate this request value for information about the request that we got. Okay, so now that we re register for this path or this pattern to call this function, then we simply say HTTP listen and search. So this is doing two things. It is not only listening for incoming requests, but it's also saying I want to serve those requests. Now this is going to make sense when we look at using the net package later where we're going to see we can do the listening ourselves and serving ourselves but it's hidden away in one function that calls a go routine or spins up a go routine to handle or serve that incoming request for us so this can handle multiple client connections so even though we have only been doing it with one client we can have multiple clients try to connect to our running server and so we're now telling the HTTP package to listen on this port. This is when we tell it to listen on this port. And this second parameter is nil. That's because we want to use the default server mux or the server multiplexer. Well, we'll talk about that later. We'll see how to write our own. And then this function return an error or something if for some reason it cannot start listening on that port or something. And then we do a fatal. If it's nil, well, then it's no big deal. Now, in terms of our very creative handler, it's just a function, like I said, that takes these two parameters. We have some text, and I simply, since I have W is a writer, I use IO write string to write to that writer this text. And I mentioned this before, I say in Go, once you know to write to a file, you can write to network or a number of other things. And we see that right here. The network, right into the network, this is our server. Writing back to the client is simply write into a writer or send in text over to a, a writer and so this is our server already running and that is why when our client did that request it was able to get this so we've written both a simple web server and a simple client this is our client that can connect to any web server but we've also demonstrated that it can connect to our web server i think this is enough for the very first lecture just to show you how easy it is to do this sort of thing in terms of exercise, take a look at the uh, supplemental video that talk about your exercise for this lecture. Take care. See you in the next lecture. So let's take a look at your exercise for this lecture. If we go down to stub exercise one and then we look at the readme. So your exercise is to write an HTTP client that fetches some data and then print out some information about the web page. So what it means is checking how many tags, how many bytes were sent back on that page and so on. So 
Here are some tags that you can search for. So there's button, div, form, input, so on, the anchor tag, and there's a, a whole lot more that you can see here. But let me just show you, let's say for example, if you don't have a web server or you can't access the internet, this is the web server you want to use. Now, if I go back, before I go into that, and look at our web server that we were using, if I look at this, our, at our web page, as you can see, we have the HTML tag, head tag, title tag. And so, because if you don't know HTML, tags are nested. So I don't really need to look for each occurrence of this. Really, I just want to find uh, the beginning tag, and this is the end tag. And you can see the end tag is slightly different than the beginning tag. So if I look for something like this, that is enough to tell me at all, I sort of have a tag. In this example document, I have head tag, paragraph tag, so I have two paragraphs. I have bold twice, so I can say, see that all the bold tag is used twice. The italic tag was used once. So that's the kind of information that I'm talking about pulling out. And of course, we can say how many bytes this document represent. So that's a small document to look at and talk about. But a much bigger document, which when I ran and fetched the data from Google, I stored into this page. And you can see there are a number of other tag, title tags, meta tags, and all script tags and other things. So essentially, you're going to fetch page from some website and give some statistics. So let's run it and see what it looks like. So the program is pretty straightforward. And I already give you sort of a skeleton of the program. Uh, we're using the flag package so you can specify a server. So by default, it tries to connect to local host, but if it can't connect to local host or you can override it. So we'll see what that looks like and when we run the code. So let's go back and go to the solution and exercise one. And let's go to client. So go build. Yep. So we have a nice little client here. And so I can run client.h and it shows me help. Now I stopped my server, so it shouldn't be running. So if I try to run client, it's going to fail, it cannot connect. But if I want to connect to Google, for example, I'm going to do https colon forward slash google.com. And it tells me at all this page from this website, it was 12,000 bytes. There was one image tag. There were 20 links on that page. There were 13 diff tags. There was one form, uh, zero buttons, and input tag. This is all I was looking for, but you can certainly add other tags. I did not look for italic tags and anything else, underlying tags and so on, but you can certainly do that. Um, I can go try, like, let's say, Yahoo, for example. And we can see Yahoo is homepage is a little bit bigger than Google. Um, anybody who uses Google know that they basically just put a search bar. That's why you, a search box, that's why you only have one form. Um, Yahoo web page, there are two forms on there. Um, we can check Bing. So you can check any number of websites you like. Um, also, much smaller than Yahoo, one form, but um, again, we can see some stats. So that is simply it. Now, if you're stuck, Take a look at the solution. Welcome to lecture two in section 11. In this lecture, we'll be looking at a slightly improved version of our HTTP server that we wrote in the previous lecture. In this lecture, we wanna be able to send dynamic data. So far, what we've been sending is static text. It hasn't changed. No matter how many times or how many clients connect, we send the same thing. So what we'd like to do is send change in data and so Based on, let's say, the time you connect, you'd see the current time, for example. So that data would have to change. So that's dynamic. We want to be able to do handle multiple requests. So far, our server only handles one request. And that's when we send a request to the path forward slash, so the root path. And we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but we'll talk a little bit about that in this lecture. The other thing we haven't done yet is see how to retrieve client info. So that would be information about the client that is connecting or making the request to your service. And finally, we'll look at reading the request body, which is something we have done already. We've shown how easy it is to just copy the request body and just print it out to the screen. But we'll show that how we can retrieve that information and do some work on it. And then I'll show you a few ways that you can submit um, requests to your service.
you don't always have to use a web browser a client of your server could be any number of things so we'll look at that let's take a look at our code here we're in section 11 lecture 2 and let's start off with a very simple example and close that explorer and so we've seen this before and um, there's not much different from the example application we did before where we had a pattern that we searched for in this case was just slash and we had a handler and each time we call our handler we would simply send a message but this time we have something slightly different we have a variable and each time our, our request comes in we would increment in number so we essentially count how many time our request handler was called and so we just simply print it out and there's always sending back some dynamic data as you could see it's nothing fancy we use an f print f and that allow us to you know modify the string and so if we were to run this code so it tells us that we listen in locally and we can go to a browser so we do localhost and our port and you can see this root handler being called one time and then if we refresh um, you can see the number is going up now I'll get back to why the number is increasing by two each time we call the handler just once. Now, what I notice is that with my Chrome and Firefox, that seems to be the issue. Each time I issue one call or refresh the screen, it calls it twice. And so, but if I do this in my Safari browser, you don't see that happening. So each time I may send a request, it just increments by one, which is the expected behavior. So I, it's something to do with the browser and not the code. So just wanted to highlight that fact, just in case you're seeing that, you think it's sort of weird. But the other thing that I mentioned is that we can use anything essentially that can send a web request to get data from our web server. So here I'm going to use the curl command and I'm going to say, I want to make a curl command to localhost and port one, two, three, four, five. And so you can see that I'm sending pull request and each time I send it, the number goes up by one. And there are a number of other things uh, you can use. I have another program called NC and so I can use that. I can use NC localhost and the port, I believe with NC it's, one, two, three, four, five. And so now I'm connected. And so for me to do a get though, because this is just a TCIP application that just made a TCP IP connection. It doesn't know anything about the HTTP protocol. Notice curl know about HTTP protocol, but NC doesn't. So in order for me to send a request, remember what I said, HTTP is nice because it's simple. I can say get forward slash HTTP, HTTP. Um, one that one for slash one that one so I want to say get that and then I have to specify host and let's say local host for example I specify host name and I can put in the port if I want but that's not required and if I send that I so I press enter notice it says HTTP one that one 200 okay and it actually send back um, the data so that's one way of doing it you can see that I can use any number of things to interact with my web server. Okay, let's get back to the code. So in the previous example, by default, when we just send a response to our client, the status was 200 okay, which is saying everything is good. We can't spend too much time on this, but basically when you send a request, the response from the server is going to have a status code that tells you whether it was okay, it's forbidden, the site has moved, uh, there are a number of things and they're defined in the package here. And so if you click on that link, for example, you can see all the status code. So 200, that's status okay. And usually that's when things are working. And there are other ones um, like 400. Um, usually things are bad. There's 500, which is the server usually have an issue. Anyway, let's send one of these status now if you look at the documentation for response writer i think it is it tells you that by default when you write data to the connection that it sends a status okay if you didn't previously call write header 
So it sends that, it calls that automatically for you. So we're going to call write header first before we send any data. You must set the header you want to send head status, your response status first before you send any data, because if you don't, it would send 200 for you. And then trying to set it afterward may not work. So let's run our application and see what happened now that we're sending a status code of forbidden, which is 403 instead of the default 200 OK. So if we go here, run our application, and we go to our browser and we refresh, we see that we're still getting results from our server. And that is true. We're still writing this. Um, what we need to be able to see is that status message. Now, if we run NC again, so I'll run NC. And remember that if I do get forward slash HTTP one that slash one that one, and then I say host colon local host, for example, and I enter, now I get this the forbidden. This is my status code before it was 200. Now, if you don't have NC, if you have curl, do the same thing with curl, I think minus or boost. And then we can see um, there, we send the request and this is the response we got back. This part represent our request, what was sent. And then this represent our response, what came back from the server, the date, the content length and content type. If you don't have curl, you don't have NC, you should be able to do it on your web browser. Now in Chrome, if you go to the side menu and then go to developer tool and then to network, you can see the request listed here and says no request. If you, requ you refresh, well, it should show you the request, the get request and so on, a type of request, you know, the method here is the status method and so on, but it's not coming up in Firefox. And that's because I think it was because we're sending text plain and it doesn't know how to, it doesn't want to show you anything for that. So that's fine because just in case you don't have any of these fancy tools like NC or curl, what you do is you go download Postman. So you go look for Postman download and search for it. And then you, this website come up called getpostman.com and you go there and you can download postman you see download a postman app click on download postman app and you can grab it for whichever system you're on now once you install the application you start it it's going to ask you to create an account but if you look very carefully at the bottom you'll see that there's something that says skip login and just take me to the application and that is what you want to do so if i start postman now this is what it looks like and so i'll start a new request just so that uh, you see how to do it. And so we want to do a get request and the URL we want to use is our local post, right? So we put in that and then we can say send. And notice when we send, we, this is the data we get back. So it shows you pretty print or basically what is a nice way of looking at it. Or you can see raw, that's what came back, but that's fine. Uh, you can do preview and all these other things, but that's our data. And if you look at headers, you're going to see the same three headers, the date, content length, and content type, which is what we saw here in the response. So we see the exact same thing here. And notice the status. Status is forbidden. This is one way in which you can do all that testing and see all the status code and so on. So we're going to use this from now on instead of our actual web browser, because this allows us to customize the method that we send. So for example, remember I talked about those methods, get, post, and so on? Well, we can do that here too. So we spent quite a bit on that example. Let's move, take a look at our second example. So this is our example of handling multiple requests. So notice I have three variables now that I'm keeping track of, um, root request and full request and bar request. So I register a handler for those. Notice the only change we made to our application is adding two more handlers and we call handle func. And this is because we're using a function to handle our pattern. I encourage you to read the documentation on how these pattern matching um, behave. And so we have functions for to handle each one of those. And so they simply respond with 
which one of the hand, the pattern they're handling. That's all there is to it. So let's run this code and test it. So there we go, it's running. Postman again to test. And so if we change this, it doesn't matter which what type of method we're using, but we use get for now. And so I send that request and notice if we go back to here, it says root handler being called. Send that again, root handler. And for us to call, and so the root handler is essentially this. We didn't specify it, but that's what it means. And so this would give us the same thing. Now, if you want to call foo, we have to say foo. And now when we send our request, notice how it says foo handler being called. And if we want to call bar, because that is the pattern that we use. And so bar being called. And so if we go back to foo now, because we keep in a count for each one of these individually. So notice how I can, so I can handle multiple. So this is my server essentially offering different services, right? There's a service at food, there's a service at bar, and there's service at slash. And you can make requests to each one of those. Now, like I said, you want to read up on how these have all these works because something like this, notice what happened. Because I do not have a handler for foo slash something. So then it goes to the root handler. So definitely um, take a look at how these work. And if you look at this, uh, you can see again when it doesn't match any of the handlers I have, then it just goes to the root handler. Uh, but that's all in the documentation, so I wouldn't spend time going over it. So in this example, we want to look at how you get information about the request, which is who sent it and so on. For this, we simply have some variables and notice we use the request value. And so you can see from the request, we can get the remote address, the requested um, URI, which is what was sent by the client in the request and the method. And this is the method I was talking about. What type of request was it? Was it a get request, a push request or whatever? And so for now, we send that back to the client, letting them know that we know all this about you. We know what you asked for. We know what your remote address is and we know what kind of request, what type of method request you send. So let's run this code and let's go back to Postman and send the request. So we're doing the get method and notice HTTP method is get. And if we change this to post and we send it, you'll see it has changed to post. And so from the server, you can know which request, now the type of request you're getting and determine whether or not you want to handle that request. And so the client address here is because it's a IP version six and I'm running it from my, my laptop. But, and so this means local host, essentially the loopback address in IP version six. But if this was from any other client on my network or something, it would show their remote address. And so this slash is the path that the client is requesting. And so if I change this to let's say foo, for example, and I enter this change, that's the request in path or URI, the resource that you're requesting. Okay, so that's an example of how you can get information from the request. So in this example or final example in this lecture, we want to look at the request body. So from the point of view of main, we haven't really changed anything. Notice how our root handler is now implemented. It uses IORITUAL read all function. Read all will read all the content from there and return it as a slice of bytes and if there's any error. So we check the error and if there's no error, we can say that there's no data from the client. Otherwise, we can take that data and we can send it back to the client Unmodify, so we said the client sent whatever, so the client, we send back to the client exactly what it sent, unmodified, and we can modify that data and then send it back also. So we print out on the screen what the client sent, and then we send back to the client what they sent, unmodify, and then we send them back the modified version. Now we try to send a little web page with some bold and paragraph. If you do not know HTML programming, don't worry about it. So let's just run this program and let's just see what we get. So we run it, and what we know is that if a client sends a request, well, we're going to print it out and then send it back. So we'll use our REST client, um, Postman. And again, let's go back, and it doesn't really matter because we have only one handler registered. Well, it will show it this way. And so you can see it detected it this time as HTML. If we go to our header, 
well, we will see text slash HTML instead of text plain, which is what we were seeing for a previous request. So now that we can get back, oh, so we didn't send any data. So that's why it's empty. Oh, so, uh, so now we need to put some data. So let's do body. And this is the request. And we don't want to send none. We want to send raw and it's just text. So let's just do hello. Let's do that. And let's send our request now and so will we get back so this is what i sent that's the input and the output is now this title version of my text and so you can send any number of things and you can send you know json and so on and just that you can receive any number of things depending on what the client the server sends and if we do this with our web browser let's say we go to our web browser refresh and so because with a web browser there's no way for me to add any body to my request that's why i send nothing and i receive nothing now there's one thing that i must mention when you read in the body you should you must close the body when you finish reading it and after you close it you can't read it again but i didn't specifically close it when i finished but i should if i was able to successfully read the data right so if you look at the documentation it explains why you should close the body so make sure that you always do that. Okay, that's it. There's an exercise for this lecture. So look at the supplemental video covering the exercise. Bye. Let's take a look at your exercise for lecture two in section 11. Now, since we just finished talking about how to handle multiple patterns in our HTTP server and how to generate dynamic data, I figure we should just do an exercise that tie those things together and show you how you can write like a simple web application. We'll be writing a Go application which renders a web page with an input box. Now, if rendering a web page with an input box sounds like something you've never done or you don't know what to do, don't worry. I give you a code for it and it's right here in this index.html file and I'll show you exactly how we use it. So the user of this application will be able to enter the username and click submit button. Once that's submitted, we'll give the user a greeting or render a greeting page. So your to-do is to then take care of if the user enter, for example, Jane, whatever the username is, you would say something like, hi, Jane, today is whatever date and time. So that's where the dynamic data part comes in. And we'll see how being able to do multiple handlers um, allow us to be able to build a simple web application like this. Now, here's a tip. I have a package called Calc that we've used before, or Cal, for calendar and that has some convenient functions for you to be able to get the date and time but those functions simply just call the time standard package so feel free to use my package or look at the time package and call those functions to get the date and time okay so let's look at this index at html i'll not try and teach you html if you don't know html but it's not very complicated in terms of what we were doing here so let me post this what we have is a form that renders an input box. So it says, what is your name with an input box? The user can then type their name into the input box. Click the button submit. The form takes the data that was entered into the form and uses the post method. Now we talk about for, for a request in HTTP, we can do different types of requests like post and those sort of thing. And so we're using post to submit our information. And there's a reason for that, but we're not gonna get into it because this course is not about HTML and the action here specify the path where we want to submit the data from the form. So in this case, we want to have an handler or a pattern called slash greet because we need to be able to handle the data that was submitted. So that's the HTML form. Okay, let's run it and see what it does. So I'll go go run. Man. So I'm already in the directory and it's building and it's running and listening to port one, two, three, four, five. So you can see when I run it, I refresh the page. It goes to our web server that's listening here, our HTTP server that's listening on this port and renders this in this HTML page, which is what we read from the index.html file. And now I can type a name. So I'll put Jane, for example, and do submit. And you can see it says, hi, Jane, today is whatever date and the time. And there's this link to go back to the home page. And I can type other names too click submit and so this is the dynamic data and notice if you notice how the path above is changing right now we're in the slash greet path which is what 
what we said will happen when we submit a form that it should go to the slash grid path and this is our own path and this path renders the html page so how is all of this happening let's go back to our code and let's look at this function so in this file i've given you most of the code so i'll skip over most of it because we're not ready to really examine it yet but basically we have the index.html file which i showed you before and that's the html code that represent the form that the user is going to be prompted with when they first go to the page which is this and so this is rendered for the user when they visit the slash path i won't talk about how it's implemented just know that that is what we send the user and i've written it for you so you don't have to worry the only other thing that you need to know is that there's a second pattern that it gets matched and that pattern is slash greet when slash greet is seen in the request it calls the greet handler the greet handler is where you need to complete your code i've already put some text or data that will be returned by this handler so all you need to do is put the rest in the middle I would say try running the code see what you get and then see what's missing if you run it without making any changes you will not see anything on the screen quite literally what you see on the screen is what you will place here so that's all you have to do ignore everything else in this main.go file and you should be okay if you're confused or you want to see the solution i provide the solution welcome to lecture three in section 11 and in this lecture, we want to look at the HTTP handler interface. What is nice about the HTTP handler interface is that you can use it to register handlers. You can use it to implement your server mocks. And if you remember, when we first looked at the HTTP package, there was this thing of a default server mocks. And what I said that was, it's just something that handle all the routing. So when you call HTTP handle func and you give it a pattern and a function, the default server mocks register that basically remembers it put it in a list and every time it sees a pattern comes in a request it looks and see which one of these pattern that has been registered closely match what's in the request and therefore uses that register function to handle the request but you can implement your own simply by implementing the http handle interface let's jump right into the code there's not too much more else to say than to actually look at it so here i'm in my visual studio code and we're looking at lecture 03 and so if we look at our example program to start with so let me close this let's start from the top so we have this constant that basically is the local address we're going to use for our server we have a type called server one and then we have a variable called root request now we've seen this before when we talk about creating dynamic responses where we use different variable like this to count how many requests went to that handler so what we can see from this is that our path slash it will call the root handler and our root handler simply increments this global variable and then return how many times this path been called now we also register a second path or pattern and that pattern is slash bar but notice how we do it we don't do a handle func to say what we register in a function to handle our path but we register a handler and so we say http handle this pattern or this path with this thing and this thing is a value of server one so this serve http is the function we need to have on a value of server one such that we can use it here and this is all we need to implement this handler interface because we have a pointer to an int we're going to make sure that we don't have any nil value if we do well then we'll return otherwise we'll increment that int and then we print out some information like this is called by you know this handler is being called for serve one and if we run our code no so this is running and we run it you can see this root handler being called one time and we should see it increment by two and i remember i said that this was a problem with chrome and firefox now the other path that we have is slash bar so when we call slash bar notice we get a different message to say this has been called only one time and two times three times four times five times six times seven times and for some odd reason well each time we call slash it's calling it twice for some odd reason but that's the browser that's doing that let's take a look at another example 
So in this example, I've simplified things a bit. We, only, we still have the server one type. However, notice that once I have a handler, HTTP handler, I can use that as my server mux. When your server mux is nil, basically when you pass a nil value to listen and serve, it tells you that if the handler is nil, then it uses the default server mux, right? So it says if the handler is nil, in which case the default server mux is used. And remember what I told you the server mux is, is the thing that's routing, checking at those register handlers, uh, register path and making a decision which one to call. But since we register our own server mux, well, guess what? That is going to be called for every path because we didn't have to specify a path. And let's run this code and we'll see. So we run the code because we have our own server mux now. Well, let's refresh this and you can see our server one is being called even though we have slash bar, we can put slash, it still be called. We can put anything and it will be called. And the reason for that is because we've registered our own server mux. So Go is saying, I'm listening and whenever a request coming for HTTP, I will call your server mux. Once you have this interface implemented, you can either call HTTP that handle, give it a path and that value, or you can use it as a server mux. So in this example, I haven't changed much. The only thing I've changed in main is now I'm creating a value of types HTTP server and storing it in this variable S1. And basically what this allows you to do is to give you more control over the HTTP server that you're going to be creating. So you can see now instead of passing to the listen function, you know, the address and server mux, now we can call the listen and serve directly on this variable of type server. But of course we have to initialize it properly. Let's run this code. And if we go back here and we open a new tab and we do localhost and we enter, notice how it's still called the same handler and we can pass anything because that's the only server we have. So every request goes to that server. So let's take a look at this example. And what I want to demonstrate is the issues you can run into if you decide to use HTTP handle font and also creating your own server. Now remember, we can use HTTP that handle and still use our a value from our type server one. But if we're gonna create our own server, notice that we're trying to do two different things. We're saying listen on our server, which means all the requests should go to our server. None will go to this slash because we're not using the default server. Keep that in mind, it's a pitfall. I just something I want to warn you about, so don't mix and match. So let's look at our final example. So I have two types here, one called server one, and then I have a server two, who's, which is also a struct, but its field is prefix, which is a string. So now I have two addresses because I want to have two servers. So each server must run on its own address. Remember that each server must listen on its own address and port. So we have the first server is going to listen on port one, two, three, four, five. The second is going to listen on port one, two, three, four, six. All right. So how do we create two servers? Well, we just configure them using the server variable give you a number of options. So for example, one of the things I could configure is a timeout. And what this means is that if my server is going to always be listening, that's not going to change. But if a client connect and to my server and then it doesn't do anything, either it doesn't send any data or read any data, for five seconds, I want my server to close that connection. And that's because I don't want clients to just connect and sit around and do nothing and tie up resources on my server. Server two does essentially the same thing, but now it get, waits 10 seconds. And this is how server two is configured. Remember the HTTP handler implementation, which has a field called prefix, and that will be used to prefix each message with the string logger. I want both of my servers to be up and running, but I don't want to exit my program without both servers exiting. So for that reason, because it's possible that I may be able to start one server because this port might be available, but then I fail to start the second one because the port is not available or vice versa. So if I can at least start one server, I don't want to just kill my program. So that's what a wait group is for. So if we look at the implementation of my server, server one, we essentially seen this before, we now increment the count, but now this count, instead of being 
the pointer itself that we want to implement is now a field in that struct. And for server two, we simply write out a message, but we prefix it with whatever the prefix we configure that server with. Here is our start server function. And so starting a server is simply kicking off a go routine. So let's run it and see. So we should see that both of our servers started. So that means we're listening on two different ports. Enter, you can see it says server one being called. And of course we can do the whole keep calling it many times. But I also have a second server, HTTP server running. Even though it's the same application, I have, so your one application can open up several ports. And so you can see when I make a request to the second server, server two, fixes it all the message with this logger. And so if I refresh, I should see a new message. And if I keep calling this, I'll see a new message because those, that's the time, the current time taken by. And so you can see it changing every second, but it still have this prefix. That's it for this lecture. Hopefully you learned something. What we did in this lecture was we looked at how to implement the HTTP handler interface, how to use that to either register a pattern by using the HTTP handle function or using it as our own server mocks. And we also saw how we can use that to configure a server where we can put timeout. We saw how we can run multiple server from the same application. No exercise for this lecture. The next lecture is going to be our last lecture for this section. And there is a lab. And then we wrap up and finish the course. Okay, take care. Thanks again. And see you in the next lecture. Welcome to lecture four in section 11, generic TCP slash IP server and client. Now you might be wondering, how does TCP slash IP differ from HTTP, which is what we've been using so far? We said that HTTP means hypertext protocol, and a protocol is the rules for communication. So what then is TCP slash IP? This can be a little bit confusing. So let me just say this. There is a suite of protocols, which means just a set of protocols, of which HTTP is one, there's FTP, there's SMTP, NTP, and a whole number of other ones. Like I said, it's a suite. And all those protocols together are called the TCP slash IP protocol suite. It just so happened that TCP and IP are also protocols. So when you take all the protocols that are built on top of TCP and slash IP, we call it the protocol suite. But when we talk about TCP by itself, it is the transmission control protocol, which is responsible for sort of how data move around from the network card and in your network stack within your operating system to your application. And when we say IP, internet protocol, this is how the data move between computers. That's all we're going to say about TCP slash IP. We're not going to look at anything else. So why generic TCP slash IP application? If you're using TCP slash IP, you can have all these other protocols on top of it that are defined and standardized, but you can also invent your own. And so by knowing generic TCP slash IP, we can then write servers and clients that connect to application that either uses or consume TCP slash IP packets. We'll see in this lecture how easy it is using Go to write a simple TCP IP client and a simple TCP server. The topics we're going to be covering in this lecture are how to write a generic TCP client, and we'll see that we can use the net.dal function to make this connection for us, and that's it from the client's perspective. In terms of implementing our generic TCP server, it's fairly simple also. We need to listen for incoming connection from clients and accept those connections. That's basically it. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor, and we're in lecture four, so I will open that. And as you can see, we have some examples to go through. And we'll just simply go into the directory and look at the examples. So let's start with example number one. So in this example, I like to go back to basics. So we have been writing producers and consumers even before we start writing Go routines. So this producer and consumer is not very different from the ones that we've been writing once we learn about Go routines and channels. And because you see the weight groups there, you know that how this means that how they are running as go routines. So let's go jump down to our producer and see what it's doing. Our producer simply tries to send messages onto a channel that it creates. If it can send a message, then it sleeps for a little bit, 
and then creates another timeout. Now, what is the purpose of the timeout? Well, we're sitting in a for loop trying to send messages. And if we cannot send a message after a certain time, well, that is when we know that oh, we don't have a consumer on the other side for our messages. And so we just give up, close our channel, and we exit this core routine. So that's the purpose for our timeout. Now, if we can send a message while well, we sleep randomly and then set a new timeout, and then we go back and try to send a message again. So let's look at new message. New message is not that very difficult. All we do is when we are asked to create a new message is we create a slice into which we copy some data, create a message that says this is from this source, which was passed to this new message function. And that's all. This basically says that our disk producer produced this message. Now let's look at the consumer. For our consumer, we sit in a for loop trying to receive messages. If we can receive a message, then we update our timeout and we process the message. Now, technically, we should really update the timeout after we process the message because we don't know how long it's going to take us to process this message. But these messages are simple, so it's okay to leave it this way. But something more correct would be to update your timer after you process message. So more like this. So what is this timeout? Well, before we even enter our for loop for wait for messages, we created a timeout. And so that means that if we're unable to read any messages, our timeout will expire and we simply return existing from this go routine. But if we can get a message, well, we just process it, create a new timeout and go back and try to receive new messages. So if we look at our process message function, it simply tallies up those integers that it got in the message and then does some statistics on it. It says the total, the average, and where it got the message from. That's basically it. And of course, how many messages. So now that we've looked at a producer and consumer, let's run our code and see what we get. We can run our code. And no surprise, what we have is our producer sending messages, our consumer consuming it, and this will go on and on. So that's not very exciting. So let's continue to our next example. So let's take a look at this example. It doesn't change a whole lot. So we have a server address and we have a remote address. So the server address is going to be used by our server and the remote address is going to be used by our client. In this case, our server really is going to be our producer and our client is going to be our consumer. So let's see how things change. So if we look at our producer, and so we jump down and look at our producer, you can see it now takes an additional parameter, which is the address where that server will be listening for client connections. So what do we do? Well, we call net.listen and we say what type of protocol we're using. And remember, we're not using like HTTP, we're using just TCP and we give it the address. And this function gives us back a listener and an error. And so with the listener, assuming we don't have an error, we simply defer closing that listener as usual, but we sit in a for loop and do what? We accept connection. So now that we have a listener, which is something that can listen to incoming connection, we have to now go listen to those connection. And so we do that by saying, calling the accept function. And the accept function returns only when we have a client connected. And as you can see from the documentation for this function, it says accept waits for and return the next connection to the listener. And so once this function returned, we know that we have a connection. Assuming there's no error associated with that connection, well, if there is, we just simply continue. We want to go back and listen because if we have a problem with a client who tries to connect and by the time we go to handle it, they went away or something. We don't want our server to exit. So we just simply go back to accepting more connections. But look what happens if we, we get a connection. Well, we spin up a Go routine to service that client. And the reason why is because we want to go back to receiving and serving additional clients. So we don't want to do that hard work of whatever the client needs in this for loop. Instead, we just kick off of Go routine. Okay, so let's see what serve client is. Serve client takes that connection that represents the connection to the client. Now notice here what's happening. We want to be able to send data over the network and we just don't want to send text or 
just bytes, we want it to be encoded in a certain way. So how is that encoded? Well, we encode our message. But in order to get a JSON encoder that can encode the message, which we get from our new message function, which hasn't changed by the way, in order to encode messages in JSON, we needed to have a JSON encoder. And so this value, the JSON encoder, was created by calling JSON that new encoder. New encoder, look what it accepts. It needs a writer, which is basically, where should I write this encoded JSON? And so by creating it with our connection and our connection implementing IO writer. And because of that, we can give it to our new encoder, which means that when we later say encode a message in JSON, well, we're actually saying to this package, you know what, take our message, turn it into JSON, and then write it out to this connection, which we know is going to be the client. And if we can do that without any error, then we delay a little bit, and then we set a deadline. Now remember, when we were using channels, what we did, we set a timeout that says, if there's no activity or no consumer ready to read a value from us after a certain time, we will just simply give up and you know don't send any more value, exit and close that channel. Here, we're doing something similar. Of course, we don't want the server to exit if the client is not responsive. What we want, is the server to close the connection to that client. And that is what the deadline does for us. We're setting a deadline on this connection, which is with a client, one client and not the server itself. And so if that client is too busy and doesn't do any reading or writing, then we close the connection. Now, please do read the documentation for all of these things. Okay, so that's how the server deals with sending messages out or waiting for clients to connect, and once they connect, how to service them. The consumer simply takes the remote server it needs to connect to. And what does it do? It tries to make a connection to that server. Again, notice it's using the net.dial function, but it is specifying that I want to use the TCP protocol. It's not using anything like HTTP, which we were using when we use HTTP.get or something like that. But now we're simply saying we want to use generic TCP. And this is the server we want to connect to. If we can make that connection, remember the server should be waiting and listening. And if we can make that connection, we get back a connection on our error. Let's say everything is good and we're able to make that connection to the server. Well, we need to decode messages that are coming from that server. So we create a JSON decoder on that connection. What we said just now, the connection implements IO reader and IO writer. So we can pass to the JSON decoder or connection so that it can read from that remote server. And now we have a JSON decoder value. So once we have a JSON decoder, we can sit in a for loop and just say decode messages into this variable. And notice we pass in a pointer so it can know where to store those value that it gets off the wire as JSON and turning them into messages. Once we get a message successfully, which means no error, then we can set a deadline on that connection saying basically, well, I want to be able to receive more messages from that server, but if for some reason the server doesn't send me a message, I will just time out and give up on that server and close the connection. Once you set a deadline, you don't have to worry about it. Go takes care of closing that connection. You just need to set the timeout. And so our timeout is essentially time now and then had five seconds to it. Now we can do what we did before, which was to set the timeout after we process the message. But as you can see, our process message function is not doing a whole lot. And we didn't have to change our process message function just as we did not have to change our create new message function either. So all the changes was just in the consumer and producer functions themselves. Let's run this and see if it works. And there you go. The results look exactly the same as before, except now we actually have a server listening on port 12345. And I can prove this by having my server run and then connect with something like curl. So if I do curl, and as you can see, this is a second client to my server, and it is just getting messages from that server. And you can see what the messages look like. 
they just look like Jason if you know Jason if you don't know Jason don't worry about it there's nothing limiting us from how many clients we can connect to our server and so there we go yet another client connected to our server so right now we have three clients connected to our server so our final example now we know how to write a client and server within one application let's just split them out into their own application so we look at what changed in this application first of all we have two separate directories for our application so we have a client directory we have a server directory we also have a package directory which here we call protocol but this is nothing fancy it's just basically the message struct that's being shared between our client and server was pulled into its own package so we'll ignore this for now because there's nothing interesting going on there and for our client well let's just open both of client and server and then close this up so this is our client so we made a copy of the previous example and just strip out the appropriate things that we did not want however there is one small change that i made on the client and that is i used the fax package so we can specify a parameter so we can connect to any server that's running on any other machine previously since they're both in the same application we know that the server was running locally but now they are separate application the server can be anywhere out on the internet or on our network now in the server we did not change anything we did not add any other properties or anything like that so let's compile these two application and run them and so there's our server and it's waiting for our clients to connect and and as we can see our client connects to our server and it's receiving data and we can go try running curl again and this should still work of course and if we had this server running on a remote system we can do the same thing so that's it in terms of this lecture and showing you how easy it is to write a client and a server using generic tcp and the key takeaway here is that for a client you simply using the net that dial function and specifying the tcp protocol and the server address for the server the only thing you're really doing is saying how do you want to listen to our client connection and that too is just the same parameter as you know the protocol and the address to listen on and then you go into accepting connection make sure that when you accept your connection you spin up a go routine to handle those connection and you go back to listening that allows you to keep picking up those clients connection if you have many clients connecting so since this is the last lecture for this section you have a lab and so please look at the supplemental video that covers what that lab is take care see you in the last video in which we wrap up and i say thank you for sticking it out with me so let's talk about the labs for section 11 and really only just one lab and i call this lab remote command runner now if command runner sounds familiar well, it should. That's because we wrote a command runner in lab one for section 10. And it was basically the idea that we wanted to have something that we can ask to run commands for us. So we wrote a Go application that runs other command and we give it the parameters for the other command by passing them on the command line. So now I want to do this remotely. And the goal really is to implement a remote command runner program. And so the requirement is that we should have a server and our server is going to run a given command and its arguments. Now, because it's the server that's running the command, we still want from the client side to be able to see what the output of that command is. And if we have to type data and send it to that command from the client side, well, we want to connect to the server and then say, well, I want you to run this command for me. And so, we should be able to monitor that and just as before we should be able to write out like how many bytes was produced or something like that though we're not going to focus so much on that in this particular lab but it's sort of similar to what we did in the previous application but the essence or the core of this application is this that a user will start up the client and say essentially i want the client to run the command ls on some remote server the users 
ask our client that we're going to write to connect to that remote server and send it all this information about the command that is supposed to run. The server is going to run that command locally on that server and then accept any input that the client sends to that command and any output from that command, it sends it back to the client. And of course, it needs to wait until that command is complete and then after it can close the connection. So that's basically the flow of this um, application. Now, let's jump to our Visual Studio Code and I can talk a little bit more about it. So let's take a look at our stub. So lab one. And so the readme essentially just tell you everything I told you before that you can start with the program that we wrote in section, the lab for section 10. And it goes into a little bit more about how we intend to pass information from the client to the server. Now, if you look at our exercise that we did, where we wrote a generic um, web server, TCP web server and client, well, we already know how to send messages. We were sending random data from our server to our client and using JSON. So we'll do the same thing here. When our client connects to the server, it will just send information about the command to be run in a JSON object, and we know how to do that already. And our server is just going to take that information and know how to parse it, just like what the client was parsing it. It would parse that, parse that information and then execute the command. And if it's successful, well, it will go from there. So this is a sequence diagram. So I have described it here in text. But if you want to see that pretty diagram, well, I also have the PNG. Now, I'm using something called Plant UML, and there is a plugin, FYI. So you can just go here and search for Plant UML plugin. And if you install a Plant UML plugin, and it will tell you how to look at those documents. So for example, I have this Plant UML document. I can do go up to View, and I can say Command Palette. And then I can say stuff like export current document or preview current document. And it will take this text and generate this PNG for me. Pretty sweet, right? Okay, so enough about that. So that's the requirements and so on for our lab. Let's sort of look at the code. Well, let's start off with a command. So I have this package called command and it simply describe the command that goes between a client to a server. And this is very similar to when we had a message. We had message, we had source, and a slice of integers. Notice, not much is different, <laughs> right? So we now have a message that we're going to be able to encode in JSON. From the client's perspective, like we said, let's close this up. From the client's perspective, it's very simple. Well, we have the white counter for content, but we're not going to worry about that right now. The client needs to know which host you want to connect to, it should connect to, to run that command. And whether or not this is a dry run. Dry run is sort of like a test. Don't actually do connect or host. And so I don't think a host with port is going to be less than five character, five bytes. So I return if that is too small. But I really don't need to handle this because when we try to connect, if the host name is invalid, it would simply fail anyway. So we can literally, we can just get rid of this if we want. Um, this is fine. But I put that up there. It's up to you if you want to keep it. So we have a connection. And so dry run, if dry run is specified, if it's not a dry run, if it's dry run, then we don't need to do this. But if it's not a dry run, then we actually want to connect. And again, net that dial. We did that in our client before. We connect to that host, the specify host the remote server, and if we can connect, then we defer closing that connection. If we can't connect, of course, it's fatal for this client application because this client doesn't do anything other than connect a server to run a command. Now, here's the important part. Just as before, we pass in the information about the command, the command name and its argument on the command line to our program. But because we're using flags to parse our command line, or we might also have other values that was passed into os.args, we really don't want to use that to figure out which arguments we should use. Rather, we should ask flags for whatever remaining argument after it's finished parsing. And so encode command actually does the hard work of taking that slice of string and turning it into a command. And by that, I mean, it's simply look and make sure it's long enough. Of course, if there's nothing, then it cannot create a command. 
If there's only one value, that's just simply the name of the command. If there are other values, then those become the arguments for the command. And it encodes it into JSON, and it just makes that into a string. So we have a new JSON encoder, and it encodes this to a string builder. Now we can encode it to a byte buffer, but because we just want a string, that's why I encode it to a string. If we encode it to, if we use bytes that buffer, then we'll have to convert that to a string. So since I know I want string, I just encode it to a string builder. And a string builder is, is a reader and a writer. So that's why I could create a new string builder and hand it to the encoder. So say encode to that string buffer uh, or that string builder. And then I create the command that I want and I say encode. Notice this is everything we've been doing in the last section. So we return that string is a JSON representation of our command. We can say, let's log the command that we're going to send to a remote server. If this is a dry run, remember dry run means that oh, we don't actually do anything. We want to return at this point. We don't want to proceed. But if we're going to proceed, we need to write to that server that we connected to. And if we can write to the server, what we want to do is be able to copy from our standard in to that server. But remember, if we actually call io.copy at this point, what would happen? We'll be blocked. IO copy blocks until there's an error, then it returns. Or, you know, so in terms of there's nothing more to do. So that's why we want to spin up a Go routine that does the copying from standard in of our client to that network. And of course, we want to set up some wait group to make sure we wait. And then the other thing we need to do is copy from our connection to standard out. And there we go. Once we have that, now this is the to-do. And I've written it for you, for those of you who might not be too sure about what's going on, even though we sort of covered this already about how to use IO copy and so on. So now we have a copying going between standard into the network and from the networks that's standard out. So which means whatever we type in our client goes over the network to our server and whatever our server sends to us comes to standard out. And that's it. That's all there is to the client. So now let's look at the server side. So we have two servers. The first server is a proof of concept. Essentially, we know that the client can encode a command to send to the server and the server is going to send back some data or we can even send some data to the server. So what we would like to see with a proof of concept server is can we accept that command, decode it and send it back. So it's almost like an echo server. So that's very easy. In main, we have our server listen to a connection and then if it can listen to connection at default closing, but it sits in a for loop, it accept connections, and then it call handle those connections. Now, we're not handling any message. Basically, we don't care. If we can't accept a connection, well, big deal. So this is our proof of concept, remember. So we just sit, sit there in a loop. What does a handle connection does? Well, it simply copy everything that's coming in from that connection, because remember C is a IO reader. So you copy everything from C back out to that connection. So where does it copy it out to? Well, it copy it to this value called command server. And command server is built with a connection itself. So why did I go through this gymnastic? Well, basically it's to prove that if we go through this writer, which we implement, well, our writer will say from server and then append whatever was given to it. So that's all there is. So our writer writes to this connection, which represent the next word connection, which is represent the remote client. It writes to that client from server, and then it also writes to that client whatever message was being was passed in. So whichever was called by it provided by copy. So again, very straightforward. If this is a bit hard for you to understand, just call this writer like this, and then make this like this. There we go. What? I cannot copy. Cut that. Paste that. I don't know what's wrong with my mouse. So essentially, that is the same exact code. So now just clear to you that we're creating a 
writer initialize with this as a field member. And so now you should be able to understand this. Okay, so let's run the code. So now it's time to test it. So we're in lab and we have both the command, the client and the server. So let's go to client and we do go run. Or let's do go build because we have a other package that we're going to enclose. So yep, so let's run that. And we cannot connect, of course. So let's have create a, another terminal so we can run our server one. So do the same thing, go build and we run our server. So our server is listening and now we connect and our client says no command provided. Well, that's understandable. And so we can provide a remote server, but our current server is fine. So we say we want to run the ls command. And notice we run the ls command, it sends this ls. And that was accepted by our remote server. We don't see anything, it says from server, and that's it. But that is exactly correct because this is just an echo server at this point. Whatever we send to our server, it's sent back the same thing, but pre prefixes it with from server. So this is our proof of test that we can send a command and we can get it back. So let's try and send a command that has options. So let's imagine it's LRT, LRT, and LRT, and maybe of the temp directory. So this is just, again, our command client saying, this is the command I'll send. This is the JSON string. And this is our server saying, I got this. And I'm sending it back for you so from server. Okay, so at least our echo server works. The thing we want to do now is turn that echo server and instead of just copying data from the connection and sending it back, what we want to be able to do now is read that command and run it and then send back output and read input. So that's server two. So if we go look at server two, let's close this. We don't have to change anything above here because this is all still the same. Here is where the to-do is. You have to complete this function. So when we handle connection, the first thing we do is that for close, and then we set a deadline, a read deadline saying, basically, if a client connects and we accept a connection from a client, we're going to give them five minutes to send or five seconds to send us a command for us to run. If they don't send us a command in five seconds, we'll just close the connection because we just don't want to accept connection and clients are not doing anything. So to complete this, you're going to read the command in JSON and execute the command and of course, send back standard in, standard out. So that's implemented in the solution. You can check it out. But for now, we'll just go run it. So let's cd. Let's go to server 2. Let's go build it. And I'm not saying that this is perfect. But there's our server. And so let's reuse the same client. We will run this command. And notice, when I send this command, it ran on the server. And the server, this is what's in my temp directory right now. And there's a little quirk with this where as um, it takes a little while to exit, you have to enter a few times, but uh, that's okay. It's not perfect, but it's still good proof of concept to show that oh, we can have a server somewhere else on another machine and we can send it commands to run. So let's try running, let's do minus LH with different option. So, and there we go. So notice how it formatted different, 11 bytes now, human readable. So that's fine. So another thing we can do is of course, build this for, G, you can say G, G O S equals Linux. And I could build this for my Linux machine or oh, not my client. I wanna build my server for example. And I can build this on my Linux machine, put it on my Linux machine, and do the command over there. So I can do 
SCP. And if I do server two, and then SSH, ESL, and I go there, and now I run my server two from over here. Well, if I run it, LS temp, well, of course it's refused because it's trying to connect the local host. But what I can do then is minus S, be sure a server zero one, port one, two, three, four, five. And I run a command and notice it's doing a LS on that auto on my Linux box, proving that oh, this is doing exactly what we say we can do. Now, this is not quite SSH, like you see me just SSH into this machine, but at least it still demonstrates the principle on which we can build. So that's it for the lab. Hopefully you find this exciting. If you've done network programming in other languages, and I've done that in C and Java, I think in Go is a lot easier. Uh, if you've never done network programming, well, hopefully you had fun doing some of these exercises and just programming and Go in general. Good luck. Post your questions and comments. And notice we have fail, command fail to run after a while. Um, so that's because our client is still connected. And if you look at the error message that I have in my thing, is that it timed out after a while because we aren't receiving, we weren't typing anything to the server. Here, for some reason, the client is not showing that it timed out, but it actually disconnected. So I had to just enter a few times. So something is kind of weird there, but at least the general concept worked.